All right, so Genesis chapter 33 is where we are going to begin today, and uh, continuing on in a series that you can see behind me is entitled Sketches in Genesis, where we are walking through the book of Genesis together uh, by looking at four of the major characters we find in the book of Genesis, Noah, uh, Abraham, Jacob, and Joseph, all right, and so today we find ourselves right in the middle, really towards the end of Jacob's story. So a couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to uh, drive down to Pennsylvania, and I got to meet up with a uh, few of my college friends. Uh, haven't seen some of them for really a lot of years, and I haven't seen all of them together for really since uh, probably the last one of us got married. And so it was a, a joyous time, a time that we got to just kind of connect. We got to golf together. We got to just hang out. And, and undoubtedly, we uh, began to reminisce, right, about our college days together, because that's how we know each other. That's where we met. And, and for me, my four years at college were some of the most foundational years of my life. Some of my best friends I met in college, my wife I met in college. And so it was a time for us to really just reminisce about um, just the days in college. And we went to a pretty strict Christian college. And so as we gathered together, we would reminisce and we'd talk about uh, a lot of the kind of funny and humorous things we, we, as we look back on the college nowadays. And so, for instance, when I was in college, and I don't know if they still do this really anymore, now I think they just find students and things like that, but when I was in college, we had demerits. All right, any of you who had, went to Christian college, you probably know of this to be true, but... We had demerits, and so you could get demerits for any number of things, for not cleaning your room, for not showing up to class, for, you know, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, or whatever the case may be, and so many demerits, and there were certain punishments, and yada, yada, yada. Yes, I was in college. I know it seems weird, but it was college. And, and so there was one thing back in the day that um, you would scan your card, and every week you would scan your card, and they had either a green screen or a red screen. Now, you wanted a green screen because that meant that everything was good and you hadn't really gotten in trouble too much. But if you scanned your card and you had a red screen, it meant you had to go to what they call the discipline committee. <laughs> yes, I'm not joking. This is real, all right? This really happened. The discipline committee. And it was there at the discipline committee that you would find out exactly what infraction you broke and how many demerits you would get and what the punishment would be and so on and so forth. Yes, again, this is college, right? This is happening all in college. And so we, were just, we would just laugh as we look back because I, I remember, thankfully not often did I have a red screen, but I remember those weeks you would have a red screen. You're just racking your brain trying to remember, okay, what did I do? Why am I in trouble? What are they going to say to me when I get there? And so kind of all week long until you show up at the discipline committee, you're on edge because you're not sure what they're going to say. You're not sure exactly what has happened. You're not sure, you know, what punishment is going to come. And so you're sitting there kind of walking on eggshells wondering what it is that's going to happen. And so maybe you've been in a situation like that, not at some weird Christian college where you had a red screen, but maybe you've been in a place where you knew there was a confrontation on the horizon, right? You knew there was a meeting that you were going to have. Maybe the boss has said, hey, I need to meet with you at this time on this day. And so until that day comes, you're kind of nervous. You're walking on eggshells. You don't know exactly what to expect. And you're kind of fearfully anticipating that day. Anybody ever been in a situation similar to that where you knew you were going to have to have a difficult conversation with somebody and you weren't sure exactly what it was to expect? Well, that's where we find Jacob as we get to Genesis chapter 33. And so as we get here to this chapter, let me just kind of by way of review tell you where Jacob's been up to this point. Remember, Jacob was the son of Isaac. He was a twin brother of Esau. Esau was born first, but yet Jacob was the one who uh, tricked his brother into giving him the birthright. He also deceived his father into getting the blessing. And so all throughout Jacob's life, he has been this deceiver, this trickster. In fact, his name means heel grabber. He's constantly trying to get ahead. And that is kind of the the biography we've seen of Jacob's life thus far. And so after he deceives his dad and, and steals the blessing from his brother, his brother is so angry that Esau is ready to kill Jacob. 
And so Jacob understands now it's time for him to get out of town. It's time for them to, him to escape. And so his mother and father agree that he is to go to his mother's family back in Padanaram. And he is to find her, uh, find his uncle Laban, because Laban has some daughters who are unmarried. And he is to go and he is to find a wife there amongst his family. And so that's what he does. He begins a long journey to Laban's household. He gets to Padanaram and he finds this beautiful woman named Rachel turns out to be his cousin, one whom he is to marry. And so he agrees to marry Rachel. And Laban says, yes, but in order to marry Rachel, you must first work for me for seven years. And so that's what he does. And the Bible says very clearly that it was like it, it flew by. That time went by so fast because he knew the prize at the end of that seven years. Well, what he didn't really realize was that as much of a trickster and deceiver as Jacob was, his uncle Laban was even worse. And so that day comes when he is to finally marry Rachel, and he wakes up the next morning to only to find out that in the darkness of night, he has been given Rachel's older sister Leah to marry instead of Rachel. Because Laban, in that culture, understood that it was not right for the younger daughter to get married before the elder daughter, and so Laban deceives Jacob, hasn't worked for seven years, and then at the last minute gives him Leah to marry instead of Rachel. And so obviously, just like you would be, he's upset, right? He's angry. And so he goes to Laban and can't believe how he's been duped and deceived into marrying Leah instead of Rachel. Well, Laban says, well, you know what? I'll give you Rachel as a wife as well, and uh, she can be your wife if you'll just work for me for seven more years. And so that's what happens. He gets Rachel, and then he works for seven more years for Laban. Now, the entire time that he is working for Laban, Laban is prospering because God's hand is on Jacob and is causing everything that Jacob touches really to prosper. And so Laban obviously does not want Jacob to leave. But it reaches a point where Jacob and his wives are finally so fed up that he decides it is time for him to leave town. And so Jacob and uh, his 11 sons and some of their daughters, they finally leave. But in order to leave and to go into the promised land that God has told Jacob his descendants are going to inhabit, he knows that he is going to have to eventually confront Esau. And so he's leaving a bad situation to go to a situation that, in his mind, could be even worse. And so that's where we pick up the story in Genesis 33. Just before this, as he is there awaiting the arrival of Esau, we talked last week about how he wrestled with God and how God really got his attention, how God is going to change his name from Jacob to Israel, and how this is really a spiritually transforming moment for Jacob. He is finally turning his heart towards God, surrendering his life to God, and from this point on, everything in his life is going to change. And so we get to chapter 33, verse number 1. And the Bible says this, And Jacob lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and 400 men with him. Just think how Jacob must have felt. 400 men coming with Esau to meet Jacob. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants, and he put the servants with their children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. And so what he's doing is dividing them really by favorites, right? Rachel is his favorite wife, so her and her son Joseph are going to be last. So hopefully, you know, when Esau comes and starts, you know, taking people out, they're the last ones to go. That's kind of the philosophy here. Verse number four, but Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. And when Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children, he said, who are these with you? And Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the servants drew near, they and their children, and they bowed down. Leah likewise and her children drew near and bowed down. And last, Joseph and Rachel drew near, and they bowed down. And Esau said, What do you mean by all this company that I met? Jacob answered, To find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, No, please, if I have found favor in your sight, then accept my present from my hand, for I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you have accepted me. Please accept my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. Thus he urged him, and he took it. 
Then Esau said, let us journey on our way, and I will go ahead of you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows what the children are, that the children are frail and that the nursing flocks and herds are a care to me. If they are driven hard for one day, all the flocks will die. Let my Lord pass on ahead of his servant, and I will lead on slowly at the pace of the livestock that are ahead of me and at the pace of the children until I come to my Lord and Sarah. So Esau said, let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. But Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. And Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Padanaram. And he camped before the city. And from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he brought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land on which he had pitched his tent. There he erected an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. And so today I want to speak to you a message I've simply entitled, A Brother's Embrace. Right? Because the reality of the situation is this. Jacob did not know what to expect when Esau approached. He was fearing the worst. He was fearing what might be. And then all of a sudden, it turned out way different. There was a reconciliation that took place that Jacob could not even begin to imagine. And so as Jacob confronts Esau in this passage, we're going to learn several important lessons, both about the transformation that is taking place in, in Jacob's life, about what it means to reconcile with a brother, and we also see in this passage a beautiful picture of the grace of God. All right, so let's pray, and then we'll dive in together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given to us. We thank you so much just for the opportunity we have just to gather together here in this place. Lord, I pray that in the moments that we share, that you will help us, Lord, just to have understanding of what it is that you want us to see from this passage. God, I pray that you will help us, Lord, just to see, Father God, just how important it is to reconcile with those who maybe we have wronged or those who we have offended. Help us to understand, Lord God, the beautiful picture of grace that you are painting for us in this passage. And I just pray that you'll help us just to open up our hearts to what it is that you have for us. And I just pray that you'll be glorified and honored in everything that we do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here we have a passage, Genesis 33, where we are going to see a lot of important lessons, I think, that can be applicable to our lives. And so we're going to see the transformation in Jacob's life. We're going to see the reconciliation that was needed. And then we are going to see just a beautiful picture of grace here in this passage. So the first thing I want us to see are the proofs of transformation. The proofs of a transformed life. As we talked about last time, in Genesis 32, there was this amazing encounter that God had with Jacob. It says that he wrestled all night long with what he thought at first was a man, but only turns out to be God himself. The pre-incarnate Christ. He is wrestling and in this wrestling match, Jacob's life is going to be transformed. And his life is going to be changed forever. And so now we get to Genesis chapter 33, and we see some of the fruit of this transformation that is taking place in Jacob's life. In Matthew chapter 7, the Bible says, people will know us by our fruit, right? If you're familiar with the Bible, it says that people can look at our lives, and they should be able to tell what our lives are based on the fruit that our lives produce. And so the proof of a transformed heart in Jacob's life will be a transformed life, right? If his heart is truly being changed and transformed, then we should see fruit of that evidenced here in his life. And so as we walk through Genesis 33 and get into chapter 34, we're going to see that by no means was Jacob perfect. But as we are going to see, we are going to begin to see glimpses of a man who has truly been transformed because of this encounter with God. After he wrestled with God, everything in his life changed. And we're going to see evidence of that here in chapter 33. So what are some of these proofs of a transformed life that we see here from Jacob? Well, first we see that there is a sincere desire to put the well-being of others first. Notice what it says in verse number three. He himself went before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. 
Verse 2 says, And he put the servants with their children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. So if you were with us last week in chapter 32, you know that Jacob was ready to divide his family and send them off in different directions, right? His thought was that if Esau comes, he'll send one wife this way and one wife this way, and whichever way Esau goes, at least the other family would be safe, right? He was essentially willing to sacrifice one wife and a set of kids for another wife and set of kids so that he at least would leave with something, But as we get to chapter 33 and we see after this encounter with God, we see now everything has changed. Instead of sending them ahead and him kind of waiting back to see what happens, he's going to take responsibility within his home and he is going to step to the front and he is going to go ahead. So he's willing to put himself out there and put other people ahead of himself. Instead of them going and encountering Esau first and him waiting to see what happens and him kind of looking out for number one, His life is beginning to be transformed, and instead, he is going to approach Esau and allow the rest of his family to kind of stay behind and see what happens. So instead of putting himself first, like we've seen him do all throughout his story so far, and seeking to save his own life and seeking to do what's best for him, he is finally looking at life with a desire to serve other people and put their well-being first. He moves himself from the back of the line, which was the safest place, and comes to the front of the line. Philippians chapter 2, the Bible says this, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, Do nothing, notice this, from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And up to this point, we would have never seen Jacob live out those verses. It was all about him and what he could get out of a situation, how he could maneuver a situation, and how he could benefit even if it meant at somebody else's detriment. But now that he's had this encounter with God and now that his life is beginning to be transformed, we see a person going from selfish to selfless. And he is allowing himself to be put in the dangerous position while his family lags behind. He is willing to serve others instead of just simply serving himself. He's willing to look out for the interests of others instead of looking out for the interests of himself. So there's a desire to put the well-being of others first. Another proof we see of a life that's being transformed is that there was a genuine humility in his dealings with Esau. There was a genuine humility in his dealings with Esau. You see, instead of looking to promote himself as the one with the birthright and the one with the blessing, instead of, you know, trying to see himself as better than Esau like he had when they were together previously, notice what he does. As he approaches Esau, the Bible says in verse 3 that he bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. So just picture this scene. Esau is off in the horizon. And as they begin to be able to see each other, we find Jacob seven times as he is approaching, falling face down to the ground, essentially bowing down before Esau. That is a greeting in those days that you would give to a king. And what he is trying to communicate to Esau is that he is no longer looking to kind of lord over Esau. In fact, when you look at this passage, you see that five different times in this passage, he refers to himself as Esau's servant. He'll say, my Lord, or he'll say, I am your servant. So we see here an attitude that is completely different than it was 20 years prior when he left. Right, Because before it was all about how he could lord over his brother Esau, stealing the birthright, stealing the blessing, getting every advantage he could in that relationship. But now, as he approaches, he has a humble heart, and he calls himself Esau's servant. So there was a genuine humility in how he dealt with his brother. A third proof of a transformed life is that there's a constant acknowledgement of God's good grace in his life. Notice what it says in verse number five. They embrace each other and 
Esau begins to hug him, it says, and when Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children, he said, who are these with you? And Jacob said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. So he understands the grace of God on his life. And that is a proof, that is a, uh, you know, an obvious sign that he is being transformed. Because you look at Esau, elsewhere in the passage, he says, you know, uh, that he doesn't need anything because, you know, I have all these things. I have oxen and donkeys and flocks, and I have all these things. But here in the life of Jacob, we see he recognizes it was because of the grace of God that he had all these things. Lamentations 3, verse 22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So unlike Esau, who said, I have enough, Jacob acknowledged that everything he had, as Esau looked and saw his wives and his children, all the livestock, and he asks, who are all these people? Jacob says, they are the gracious gift that God has given me. Isn't that an amazing picture compared to where we've seen Jacob up to this point? His life is being transformed, and now he is acknowledging that everything he has is not because he's done it himself or because he's earned it on his own. Everything he has is a result of God's gracious goodness on his life. And the Bible tells us in James that in our lives, every good and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning. And so one of the characteristics of a life that is being transformed is an acknowledgement that God's grace is prevalent on your life, that everything we have is because of God and his goodness and his grace, and we deserve nothing a fourth characteristic, there's a noticeable generosity that develops in Jacob's life. A noticeable generosity. Look at what it says in verse number eight. Esau said, what do you mean by all this company that I met? Jacob's answer, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. And so here, Jacob's had all these possessions. And we talked about it last week. All these animals, all these possessions, but yet, He's willing to generously give them to Esau in hopes of finding favor. He is developing a heart that is generous. And one of the keys to a life that's being transformed by God is a person who understands the importance of generosity, right? We understand that what we have is not our own, and so we can be generous. Instead of living closed-fisted, we can live open-handed and realize that, God, everything I have is yours, so help me just to be generous and to give it out. And so that's where Jacob is. He's at a place where he realizes everything he has is because of the grace of God, and so he's willing to be generous. If it means he can gain favor in the eyes of his brother, then I'll just send all the animals I need to in hopes of finding favor. I'm willing to give up all these things to live this generous life, to give him all these possessions that I at one time would have tried to hoard to myself in order to find favor in the eyes of my brother. And so we see another key to this transforming power of God that is taking place in Jacob's life is the fact that he's willing to part with some of these possessions. He's being transformed and therefore living a more generous life. And the last characteristic I want to bring to your attention is found at the very end of this passage where we find him building this altar. And it says, there he erected an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. That altar, that name means God, the God of Israel. And so it was no longer the God of Abraham. It was no longer the God of Isaac. It was now the God of Jacob. He was making it personal. He now had a personal relationship with God. And so the fifth characteristic of a life that's being transformed is there is a conscious longing to glorify God as his personal God. It was no longer his granddaddy's God or his father's God. It was now his God. And we see that in what he named that altar. The altar was named El Elohi Israel, which means God, the God of Israel. 
And when we look at our lives, we need to understand that the primary aim of a believer's life should be to glorify God. In fact, there's no finer pursuit in all of life than the pursuit of God's glory. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 10, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Amen? And so that's how we need to live our lives. And we see that Jacob has gone from living for himself to now living for the glory of God. He is seeking to worship and glorify a God who is now personal to him. It's no longer this God who is distant, who his father knew and his grandfather knew. It is now a God that he has wrestled with and encountered firsthand, and it is now his personal God. And his aim and his goal in life is to glorify God by the way that he lives his life. And he attributes that by the name he gives this altar, the God of Israel. And so we see, although Jacob is not perfect, there are some things taking place in his life that evidence the fact that his life truly is being transformed. He's generous. He's humble. He has a personal acknowledgement of God. He's, you know, recognizing that God's grace has been abundant in his life. And instead of trying to lord it over Esau, he is picturing himself as Esau's servant making himself lower than Esau, complete difference than what it was 20 years before when he left town. So we see some positive things here taking place in Jacob's life, which is good because we've been covering all these chapters and it seems like one negative thing after another. Jacob, you can never get it right. What is going on? But we finally see some positive things taking place. This wrestling match with God has begun to transform him. Now, unfortunately, like any of us, we might be experiencing these same signs of transformation, but yet we realize we also don't have it all together. If you read on in the story, you find that there is still a lot of work for Jacob to do. Notice how it says there at the end of the passage, he went and he began to build himself a house and made booze for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. And so instead of going to Bethel where he was supposed to go, he kind of stopped short. And then he goes and he sets up camp in Shechem, which was technically in the promised land, but still not quite where he needed to be. So we still have this partial obedience. And him camping there in Shechem is going to cause all sorts of problems, as you'll see when you read chapter 34. And so we see that Jacob, although there's a lot of good things taking place in his life, he still has a long way to go. But I think if we're honest with ourselves... We could say the same thing about our lives too, right? Hopefully we can see some of these characteristics resonate true in our lives if we've been walking with Jesus for any length of time. Hopefully we can see maybe this kind of desire to put others first developing in our life. Hopefully we can see some generosity, you know, pouring out of our lives. Hopefully we can see a humility that God is developing in us. But at the end of the day, no matter how well on our way we are to some of these things, we still have a long way to go just like Jacob, because all of us are a work in progress. And that's what we see here in Jacob. Despite having this encounter of God and despite the fact that he's moving in the right direction, he still has some work to be done. So the first thing I think that comes to the surface as we read chapter 33 is kind of this evidence of the transformation that is taking place in Jacob's life. So now that we've seen that and we've seen the proofs of a transformed life, I now want to look at the principles we find in this passage of reconciliation. Because not only does the story show us some important elements of a transformed life, it also shows us some great principles regarding reconciliation. So let me begin by asking you a question. How many of you have ever done something to offend another person? Anybody ever been there? Okay. Good. Now, how many of you have ever been offended by another person? Okay, good. So this is going to be relevant to all of us, I think. All right? I think all of us probably find ourselves or have found ourselves in a similar situation that we find Jacob in here, where he is fearful about reconciling with a brother. We've all been there, whether we've been the offending party or someone has offended us. And regardless of what caused the fracture in the relationship, there are some important things we must understand about reconciliation. I think several of them kind of bubble up to the surface here in this passage. And so 
if you get nothing else out of today or you write nothing else down, and I should have taken the time to put it on the screen so you could see it, but I would encourage you, make a note in your phone, write this down, because there's five things we see here about reconciliation that are going to be very integral to each of our lives if we ever have to go through this with a fellow brother or sister. If you're a person who tends to at times offend somebody, or you're a person who at times has been offended, this can be very helpful for you. And so I hope that you'll take time to write it down so you can remember it. So what are some of these principles we find of reconciliation as we see here in Genesis 33? Well, the first one is this. Reconciliation is a necessity in our relationship with God. Can I say that again? Reconciliation with a brother or a sister is a necessity in our relationship with God. Do you know that if you truly want to seek after God, you must desire to reconcile with those around you? Because your relationship with God is directly related to how you are in fellowship with those around you. That's why it says in Matthew 5, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. You see, if you are not willing to reconcile with those around you, how can you even be willing to seek after God and seek reconciliation with him? And so the first principle of reconciliation is that we must understand how vital it is when it comes to our own personal relationship with God. If we want to pursue a close relationship with God, then we must be serious about reconciliation. It's a necessity in our relationship with God. Secondly, reconciliation should start with prayer. Reconciliation should start with prayer. Do you know that you don't have the power to change somebody else's heart? You don't have the power to change somebody else's mind? You don't have the power to change somebody else's perspective, somebody else's vantage point. Which is why you need to make sure anytime there is reconciliation that needs to be done, you first bathe the entire situation in prayer. Let's backtrack for a minute to Genesis 32. In verse number 9 through 11, we get evidence here of Jacob doing just this. It says in verse 9, And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred, that I may do good you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children." And so here he's pouring out his heart to God. He is vulnerable before God saying, God, I'm afraid of Esau. I'm afraid of what he could do to me and my family. And I desperately need you to intervene if I am going to reconcile with Esau. Because Jacob understood that he was wrong, that he had messed up. And when it comes to changing Esau's heart, at the end of the day, he had no power to do that. No matter how many gifts he sent ahead, no matter how much he begged, at the end of the day, his change of heart was going to be directly related to what God was going to do. And so we need to understand if reconciliation is needed in our lives, God is the only one who can change hearts. So we must cry out to him if we want reconciliation to occur. So it's necessary in our relationship with God. It must start with prayer. The third principle here of reconciliation is that reconciliation requires us to take the initiative. It requires us to take the initiative. Because reconciliation will not just happen on its own. We must step into the process. We must step into the game. We must be willing to take the first step and bring about reconciliation. How many people in here have ever broken a bone? Anybody in here ever broken a bone? Okay, several of you. When you break a bone, what is typically the first thing you do? 
Do you just sit back and say, well, it looks like it's broken, it's out of place, it's cracked, I'm just going to kind of sit back and wait for something good to happen? No, most of the time, what do you do? You want to make sure you go to the doctor, go to the hospital, get it set in place, and then let the healing process occur, right? The same thing is true when it comes to reconciliation. You can't just sit back and say, well, over time, everything will just kind of even out. Now, time can help heal a lot of things, but time will not bring complete healing to a situation, And so we need to understand that if reconciliation is needed, it means that we are going to have to take the initiative. In order to heal broken relationships, we must be proactive. That's why it says in Matthew 18, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. You must be proactive when it comes to reconciliation. Because I've noticed sometimes I've offended people, and I didn't even know I offended people until they came and told me. And then I realized what I did, and I was apologetic for it and realized how it hurt them. But had they not been proactive, I would have never known that I offended them. And so if you want reconciliation to take place in a relationship, don't just wait for the other person to respond. If there's an offense, you step into it and say, okay, what do I need to do to help bring about reconciliation in this situation? That's what Jacob did here, right? He knew it was time to leave Laban. Life there wasn't good, but he knew that going home meant he's going to have to deal with his past. And as much as he didn't want to do it, as much as he's crying out to God, as much as he's sending gifts, he knew it was inevitable That if he was going to get where God wanted him to be, he was going to have to eventually make face-to-face contact with Esau. And so he was proactive, and he took initiative in trying to rectify the situation. So he requires us to take the initiative. It's something that should start with prayer. We have to understand that reconciliation is vital in our relationship with God. But the fourth principle is this, reconciliation demands humility. Reconciliation demands humility. Reconciliation is not about getting the upper hand. It's not about winning. Reconciliation is about restoring a relationship. Being humble means that not everything has to be resolved in exactly the way you want it to. Did you know that? Because there are times you're not going to see eye to eye. But reconciliation is not about winning an argument or winning a fight. It's about restoring a relationship. In fact, Rick Warren says this, emphasize reconciliation, not resolution. It is unrealistic to expect everyone to agree about everything. Reconciliation focuses on the relationship while resolution focuses on the problem. When we focus on reconciliation, the problem loses significance and often becomes irrelevant. So we need to understand when it comes to reconciliation, it is about restoring a relationship, not winning a fight or winning an argument or getting the upper hand. It's about understanding that there is a fracture between me and this person, and I want to do whatever I can to restore that relationship and bring it back to a healthy place but it's going to demand humility. That's why James 4 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Fifth principle of reconciliation. Reconciliation focuses more on the future than on the past. Reconciliation focuses more on the future than it does on the past. Now, the offense between Jacob and Esau was obvious. But as they meet for the very first time in 20 years here, we never see Esau hold that over Jacob's head. It was obvious what the problem was. They both knew why they'd been apart for so long. But what does Esau do? He runs, he grabs his brother around the neck, and he hugs him. He doesn't say, I can't believe you did this. You should feel ashamed of yourself. It's about time you come back seeking apology. He didn't do any of that. What did he focus on? He focused 
on the future of their relationship together instead of being bitter about the past and what Jacob had done. Esau was no longer holding a grudge. He had forgiven his brother and now was ready to move on. I love what it says in verse number 12. After they've had their interaction, notice what it says. Then Esau said, let us journey on our way and I will go ahead of you. Isn't that amazing? He's now saying, hey, listen, we've been apart for so long. Let's now journey on our way together. I'll protect you. I'll take care of you. I'll lead the way. I have all these soldiers. They're going to help you get to where you need to be. He's no longer holding a grudge over what happened in the past. He's all about restoring the relationship that he once had with his brother. Alan Patton said this, It is not forgive and forget as if nothing wrong ever happened, but forgive and go forward, building on the mistakes of the past and the energy generated by reconciliation to create a new future. The pursuit of reconciliation can be a difficult endeavor, but if you've ever gone through it, you know that it certainly is a worthwhile endeavor. Desmond Tutu said this, forgiving and being reconciled to our enemies or our loved ones are not about pretending that things are other than they are. It's not about patting another on the back and turning a blind eye to the wrong. True reconciliation exposes the awfulness, the abuse, the hurt, the truth. It could even sometimes make things worse. It is a risky undertaking, but in the end, it is worthwhile because in the end, only an honest confrontation with reality can bring real healing. Superficial reconciliation can only bring superficial healing. And so as followers of Jesus, if we're truly concerned about our own relationship with God, we have got to be concerned about our relationship with others. And if there's a fracture in a relationship, we must understand the importance of stepping into the situation, being the bigger person, being humble enough to say, you know what, there's an issue here. What can we do to make it right? To stop focusing on the past and start moving ahead together in the future. Amen. So one more time, those five principles of reconciliation. It is a necessity in our relationship with God. Reconciliation should start with prayer. Reconciliation requires us to take the initiative. Reconciliation demands our humility. And reconciliation focuses more on the future than it does on the past. So as believers, we must understand our calling in life is a calling to reconciliation. One of my favorite passages of scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. And we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Isn't that amazing? That God is making his appeal to the world through us. And it's our job, our responsibility as his ambassadors to proclaim the message of reconciliation. To bring peace into a world of chaos. To bring unity into a world of division. And to proclaim the good news of the gospel into a world that is lost and dying without hope. We are his ambassadors proclaiming the message of reconciliation. That what man through sin has broken, God through Christ longs to restore. That is the message of reconciliation. And that is what we are called to do as believers. And so we must understand how vital it is to be his ambassadors of reconciliation. So we see the principles of reconciliation. We saw the proofs of Jacob and his transformed life, but real briefly as we close, as really a way of conclusion, I want to also point out to you a great picture we see here of grace. Just an amazing picture of grace. 
Grace, as we talk about the word, is a term we maybe hear often in church, but it simply means unmerited favor. Jacob did not deserve to be forgiven by Esau. Jacob was in the wrong, clearly, and he had made a mess of things, and any attempts in his effort to try to get things right really were all up to Esau because Jacob was the offending party. However, thankfully, we see in this passage that Esau's heart has changed in the 20 years, and he's willing to forgive Jacob. But it's not because of the gifts that Jacob appeals with. It's not because of all the nice things he tries to send. It's simply because he was ready to restore his relationship with his brother. And I want you to notice in this passage, we have two different views of really grace, as we might say. Notice in verse 8. Esau said, what do you mean by all this company that I met? And Jacob answered, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. So in the beginning, Jacob is sending all these gifts because what is he trying to do? He's trying to earn Esau's favor. Have you ever talked to people in life who are trying to earn God's favor by things that they do? And they say, if I do this and I do this and I say this and I'm nice here and I do all these things, that maybe I can earn God's grace and I can earn God's favor. You see, so many people, that's what they view a relationship with God as. If I can just do all these things, I can maybe earn God's favor. If my good outweighs my bad, then I can earn God's favor when it's all said and done. And that's where Jacob was in the beginning. But then he meets Esau, and they hug, and he has conversation. And notice what it then says as we move forward into verse number 12, or 11. It says, please accept my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt gracious with me because I have enough. Thus he urged him, and he took it. Sorry, let me read verse 10. Jacob said, no, please, if you have found favor in your sight, Then accept my present from my hand, for I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you have accepted me. So early on, he was trying to find favor by all these things he was sending ahead. But now he meets Esau. He realizes that all those gifts meant nothing. And now he's simply saying, hey, just take these gifts because I realize I've already found favor in your sight. Take these gifts because I just want you to know that I'm appreciative of you extending grace and favor to me. There's a big difference, isn't there? In the beginning, he was trying to find God's favor by sending the gifts. And now at the end, he is wanting to give gifts because he realizes he's already found favor in Esau's sight. And that's how it is for us in our relationship with God. If you think you can earn your way into a relationship with God, you are sorely mistaken. You cannot do anything to earn God's favor. You cannot do anything to earn God's grace. God already has poured his favor on you. God has already expressed his grace to you in sending Jesus Christ. And so now what do we do? As a response to his grace, we then seek to live in his favor and please him and honor him and live for him, not to earn his grace, but because we are recipients of his grace. Amen? And so we see a beautiful picture here of grace in this interaction between Esau and and Jacob. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Isn't that good? Not a result of anything that we can do, but all because of what Jesus has done. When I was in college, I hated that stinking red screen. However, that red screen was revealing that there was a problem. It was revealing that something needed to be dealt with. It was revealing that something needed to be resolved. And for many of us, maybe there's a relationship in our lives currently where that red screen is showing, where we need to deal with. Because the truth of the matter is, until we deal with that, we can't truly be in a right relationship with God. And so here in Genesis 33, we see a wonderful kind of formula for what reconciliation looks like. 
We also see some great proofs of a transformed life. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, I think I'm right with everybody, but maybe I need to hone in on some of these you know, characteristics of a transformed life. I need to be more humble. I need to be more generous. I need to seek to put others above myself. I don't know. There was so much in this passage that could hit home, and I don't know how God's going to land it in the runway of your life, but I will say this. I'm pretty sure that anytime the Word of God is open and your heart is open, that the Spirit of God is trying to get across something to you. And so here is your moment to take that, to deal with it, to do business with God, and for you to allow the Spirit of God to go to work in your life. Until we pursue reconciliation, true healing cannot occur. And so maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, Pastor Justin, I need As soon as this service is over, I need to go find somebody and I need to reconcile a relationship with them. Can I encourage you? Step out in courage and do it. Pray, ask God to help and guide you and you'll be amazed at how God blesses your life because of your desire to be reconciled to a brother. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, Pastor Justin, I've been trying to earn God's favor all my life, but today I realize that it's not about earning his favor It's about simply responding to the favor he's already poured onto my life. So maybe you're watching today and you say, you know what, Pastor Justin, today I need to respond to God's grace, not by trying to earn my place in his family, but by recognizing that he's already done everything necessary. And so today I'm going to respond to his grace and simply accept it and move forward trying to live my life to please him. If that's you and you need a relationship with Jesus and you're watching online, can I encourage you to text the word surrender to the number you're going to see on your screen. There's no magic in that text. It's simply a way for us to know that God is working in your heart so we can come alongside and help you and give you some resources that will help you on that journey. And so, again, I don't know where this lands in the runway of your heart today, but I pray that whatever God is trying to teach you, whatever God is trying to tell you, don't just put up your arm and stiff arm it away and say, no, I'm not going to deal with that right now but instead choose to not just be a hearer of God's word, but to also be a doer. Amen? Amen. So, Father, thank you for this time that we have in your word. Thank you for the opportunity we've had just to, God, dive into your word together. And I pray that, Father, in the moments we've shared, we've been encouraged, we've been challenged, we've enjoyed the fellowship, the time of worship was a blessing But I pray even more than that, that we've allowed your spirit to go to work in our heart. So God, I pray that you'll dismiss us now with your blessing. You'll help us to walk with you. And whatever it is you're putting on our heart, whatever decision it is we need to make, help us to move here with the courage and the tenacity to do whatever it is you're putting on our heart to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.